planned work getting in the way, trying to find time to make that change you want, don't worry anymore. I'm going to share with you the strategy that I use with the teams that I have the honor of supporting. And then Paul and I are going to break down big exits, big funding rounds, huge valuations. But really what we're going to look at are the innovation trends that you need to know about. It's all on today's show. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Brought to you by, do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Are you getting pressure to improve your data security? Would you like a faster, easier, better way to patch? Then you need to check out Automox. Automox is a cloud-native platform that patches and manages every endpoint, even remote servers and devices, including Windows, Mac, Linux, and third-party software from a single dashboard. Improve your cyber hygiene, reduce your attack surface, and save 90% of the effort you spend patching. Automox, your patching system of record. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash BSW. Active Countermeasures. Make every analyst a hunter. Hello, and welcome to Business Security Weekly. We're at episode number 90, and we're recording this on Monday, June 25th, 2018. This is the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Our goal is to be your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. I am still Michael Santarcangelo, your straight-talking guide. And I'm excited to be here with you today, especially today. I'm going to share some stuff I've been using with the teams that I work with. And ever dapper with an excellent new microphone is your friend of mine, Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone. This BSW episode that I'm always excited about to do BSW, especially this episode and every episode. Because we're putting a BS in BSW. That's that's our our new tagline. That's right. Yeah, I got a little spiffiness on my microphone, you know, just some some tricking it out, some the actual right parts for this microphone to make it look more professional, I guess. I love that. I love it's that. Nice. Well, the sound, the sound of that microphone. You know, every now and then people ask us mm-hmm. about the tech we use and the way that we do it, and uh, you've guided me in on this headset, and it's been fantastic. Yeah. But I still kind of covet get myself a nice boom arm and a, a nice mic like that, and bring in that that nice bass sound and uh, so yeah it's, uh, and it's this exciting. is the, the Heil PR40 it's one of those like standard broadcast uh microphones um and it just it has that deep nice awesome sound to it that I like so it's my yeah, choice. I'm a big fan of the dynamic mics so um all right so just to, as a reminder for everybody we're kind of on our our summer programming it's both we're taking a look at the stats and we're taking a look at the evidence uh, suggesting how long people engage and what they like so we're working to keep everything tight for you guys and and uh, and still get some feedback. And we're going to keep measuring it and, and engaging with you and figure all that out. Um, a couple other things that we've talked about content-wise and what this means. We're just going to sh- shuffle some stuff around. So, for example, I'm working on my content plan this week. And that's going to look at both uh, the stuff I'm creating that then we can carry forward into segments like we're going about to do with the time audit as well as um, really trying to figure out how to do a sustainable book club and, and look at some of that stuff there the right way. And I know we've talked about the vendor value prop scorecard. I'm actually planning the beta for that next week. I got a little busy with clients, which is a, gr- a great thing, and I'm actually really excited about that, which actually means I can carry some better insights forward. And I've got a new program I'm going to launch for vendors that will work in conjunction with the value prop scorecard for vendors. So all that's coming, um, and I'll, I'll be busy all summer. So I guess since I live at a beach all year, Paul, 
um, I can work through the summer when everybody else goes to the beach because, um, mm-hmm. you know, I guess I've, I've had it. So, what, so here's what we're talking about today with, with the time audit. And it would only be fair, of course, if we start with what problem are we trying to solve. I'm going to come at it a little bit circular, but what I find a lot of times when I come in to work with teams, uh, and lately, Paul, I've been working with enterprise security teams. They tend to be, it's kind of interesting. If you're a team of 10 or less, you, you can manage. You can manage by spreadsheet. You can you can manage just kind of shooting notes back and forth and figuring it out. A lot of the teams that I've been working with in the last two or three years have grown past 10 people. And then once you get to about 15 to 17, and I feel like 17 is almost a magic number, you start to find friction. It starts to get tougher to figure things out. There's a there's a lot of pieces that get jumbled up and lost, and then uh, on up to you know 20 plus people. One of the questions then when I come in and I start working with these teams, and keep keep in mind th- these are high performance teams to begin with. These these are it's it's you know it's nobody here is broken. Like a lot of people in security, like if you think you're broken, you're probably not. You're probably busting as hard and as fast as you can, which then means when I ask questions like, so what are your your three your top three strategic, tactical, whatever. What are your top three goals, initiatives of the year? I get a lot of, mm, that's a good question. So then when I say, what's getting in the way? Like, what's getting in the way of us defining it? What's getting in the way of you achieving that? We kind of come back to this concept of unplanned work, right? And a lot of us in security, we've known sure. for a while that we need to be reactionary, but there's still a certain amount of unplanned work, which makes it almost impossible to get to the stuff that you, you want know, to do. And Michael, as you say that, right, I I went back to my time that I spent working for uh, the lottery company, right? And then I worked for a university in a, in a security role in like a more traditional, uh, it's my job to help secure the organization. I, and I find that in all the roles that I've had and all the roles that, you know, I've talked with people in the roles that they have, you have to communicate with a lot of different groups within the organization. Like I feel like when I was at both the lottery company and university, I got the opportunity to meet a lot of different people. And I think about it, it's because I had to, right? Because security has to interface with IT. They have to interface with the network team, the sysadmin team, the business owners, the data owners. If you run this department or this remote location, I interacted with a lot of people in the organization and that communication was just so important, but also when you started this second, right? Difficult to manage. So my security and team may only be two people. it takes a lot of time that we, right? don't, that we don't account for. Yeah. And my right. security team might only be two people, but I've got to talk to hundreds of people that uh, in the organization for different, for various reasons, all security right. related. And I just feel like like we have this like spider web of communications where, you know, if you work in corporate communications or you know, you're a sysadmin, you, you might not have that many, there's many people to interact with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Well, uh, and so, and in fact, what's great about that is you just led into my second question. How much capacity does your team have? Mm. Think about how much time we spend on the margins. And, 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 and what that means is we're borrowing time we don't actually have. So you might, and, and I'm not really worried about, well, you're only paid for 40 hours a week or 37 and a half or whatever. No, no. I'm actually just looking at it and saying, what's a, what's a reasonable workload in any given day and in any given week, and how many of us are doing work early hours and after hours and weekends because that's how we get ahead. Now, on an individual basis, if that's a decision you make, I think it's a great decision. Look, I've, I've made that decision in my career, and I've been happy for it, I think. I don't know. I'm, but here's the point. If I'm leading the team and I'm asking everybody to do all this on margin – that's nuts. Like that's the fastest way to burn people out. But more importantly, they don't even know. So the other question I'll start asking people is, okay, well, we've laid out some changes, right? We've got our best our best next steps and we have our pathway and we're excited about it. Okay, well, how much time do we have to dedicate to this? And what does that look like? And how do we do that? People go, oh, I don't know. And here's the thing. I need to know if only to understand how to pace that change, how to pace that stuff. And so this is kind of like one of those, yep, it's a little squishy, a little hard to measure, and, and we want to do this. So let's talk about how then, right? And, and what I do, what the, the solution, right, problem, uh, and then solution. The solution here is called a time audit. So let me be clear on a couple of things. This is not time tracking. I've, I've had this conversation with a couple of people in the last two weeks where they go, oh, yeah, no, we're trying to figure out how to track time too. Nope. I, I, you do track your time to a certain extent, but it's very loose. I'm going to explain how in a second. Uh, in order to get this to, and get it the way that you want. But this isn't time tracking. Because, and here's why. I don't like time tracking. Nobody likes time tracking. It's horrible. It's, and and I, this isn't the purpose of this. This is this is designed to take two weeks. And and it's kind of patterned on my idea of the two-week test. And, and we'll do a segment on that at some point as well. I've actually been revamping parts of that. But, but here's the basics. You need to take an action every day for two weeks. 
and you can potentially take it for three weeks if you see the benefit or need to do a tweak or whatever else. That's a two-week test. Two up to three weeks, but it's really you're just focusing on two weeks. That's it. So it's two weeks. So here's the rest of what I want to be able to see. Simple. Simple really matters. In fact, simple is the key to this. So this is where I've spent a lot of time. You get down to five minutes a day. You got to track your time, but only in 30-minute blocks, and then you go across five categories. Paul, this is where it's made the difference. So here's the five categories that I like to use. Administrative, planned, unplanned, anticipated, and development. Let me go over those real quick. And, and then I, I'm going to give you another example of other ways to think about it. But in those basic, when, I just, when I'm working with the team, and I do this both with vendors and enterprise security teams, administrative stuff is exactly what you're talking about, Paul. It's I've got to send the emails. I've got to review these forms. I need to get this thing done in some particular way. i got to file these and, tickets. i got to enter my expense report. Vacation it's time, exactly that kind right. Of stuff. Yeah. So the, these are things you have to do, but and and they take time, so mm -hmm. you, you stick them there. Now, if now, but let me be clear. If so, plan time is, I've got a project, right? So it's typically a project or it's an effort. It could be also this is an operational task. I review the logs every day, and sure. it takes me an hour. Okay, cool. Now, if what you're emailing about is related to something planned, that goes in the planned bucket. Mm -hmm. If what you're doing is more generic or it's tougher to pin down, it goes in the admin bucket. Unplanned work is what we're looking for. That's the stuff that just socks us out of left, you know, left yeah. field and, and we're blown out. Anticipated is the way that I look at it now because a lot of security teams are either operationally focused or have an operational component. Mm -hmm. And they always say, well, Michael, most of our work is unplanned. And so what we've been able to do with those teams is say, well, it's not really that unplanned, right? It's unpredictable, but it's not unplanned. And, and I've worked with two teams in the last two months and said, can we break down let's say over a week, a month, um, and just a quarter, how many major incidents that you're finding that you're responding to and how that kind of turns out. It turns out we could. So now we can anticipate the time. And, and, and that's important because it's kind of like, you've heard me talk before about chaos time. Anticipated time says, look, I know over the course of this month, we're going to spend 100 hours responding to incidents. Okay, well, let's go use it up. Let's go, fit, but we can budget for it. And that's mm. kind of the point to it. The development is really important too. And this works in one of two ways. If it's just you, it's the time you're putting into yourself. Are you learning how to write better? Are you reading books? Are you attending training? Are you doing some sort of self-paced training? Are you going to online school? Are you doing any of those things? That counts in your development time. Are you responsible for other people and are therefore you helping them? Are you mentoring somebody? Are you coaching them? Are you providing training? That all goes in there. And all you're looking at are 30 minute blocks. Now, I looked at this myself, uh, and they said, okay, could I use those same categories? And the answer is yes, kind of. Here's what I would change a little bit, though, too. Uh, like for me, in terms of anticipated, I would probably change it out to content or production, right? And so what happens there is, like I've said this before, Mondays for me are, are my production days, right? So we've got this show planned out. There's no show June, July 2nd. We've got July 9th already planned out. We've got July 16th already planned out. And now that gives me a little space to go build up my content plan to start coming up with better, more content responsive to our particular needs. Well, I want to track how much time I'm actually spending on content. And as we do more, if that means it spills into some other days, I just I need to get a sense of that. So I might swap one of these, these out. So these are not the only five categories, but these are five really good categories to start with because it helps people get a pretty good look at where their time is going. Well, and I want to just go back to when you calculate it and you say, okay, I know that well, on average, we might spend 200 hours a month or whatever collectively as a team on unplanned work. If you budget for that, you can then take some time that's left over out of that and say, okay, how do we get that 200 number down to like 50, right? Or yeah, set a goal for yourself. That's yeah, that's exactly right. So, but then budget yeah, right. time to go, okay, well, let's take some time and review our unplanned work and plan some work to reduce our unplanned work, right? That's what the Phoenix Project uh, that, that's talks exactly about right. yeah, and, and, and that's what so, we've done here in our production, right? Like, we know how much unplanned work, and we kind of know like when unplanned work happens, like rebuilding a system or reconfiguring something. We know like collectively could take about twenty hours. Right. So yep. let's go. Okay, let's plan some work to put that in. And when it's it's interesting, what I find is when it's planned work, it can it, it takes less time than when it's unplanned work, even though you have the same outcome. Crazy, isn't it? Right not crazy actually it's 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 amazing how it works i told you at the top of the show before we started recording some of these changes i mean i i'm very careful that i i eat my own dog food right as a cobbler's kid my kids aren't wearing my kids are wearing shoes 
uh, because I, I don't want to be the person saying, well, this is how to do it. Well, do you do it? No, no, I, guys, I'm doing this. And, and it's been a fina- it's been fascinating for me, both as I'm learning how to do it better and faster and make it easier, right? I'm, I've become uh, fanatical about light lift on people when they're trying to make changes, but we need some of this detail. And, and this is the way we've started to be able to do it. I typically give people three ways to capture the time. Paul, I want to come back to, to something you just said, but I want to touch it again in, when we get to like the so what section of this, because you just laid out something really important, uh, whether you're doing agile or anything else. Mm-hmm. But, but let's talk about how to capture time. I, I've seen three basic ways work. And so, so this is one of those areas where I, I look at, I'm going to give you the framework. And if you want to develop your own system that works for me, keep in mind, my expectation is only going to spend five minutes a day on it. Now, in all fairness, I have progressions where you can spend more, and that's what we'll talk about that in a second. But but it comes down to this: one, you can just use your calendar. If you're a calendar-driven person, you like calendars, you can just color code your time, Um, and and that's usually what I recommend, right? Create a couple different things and and block it out, color code it, or whatever else. So you're not inviting anybody to the meetings. It's just more about how you block and account for the time that you had. If you've already got meetings spun up on your calendar, all you're doing is filling in the blank spaces in 30-minute increments based on where and how you allocated your time. For a lot of people, that makes a lot of sense. The other thing that's happened is, uh, for a lot of teams I work with, I just give them a spreadsheet. And and it's got you know before hours, after hours, weekend, and then a core, I think I run it from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And just say, here, shade in the blocks based on whatever you did. And you know somebody like Sam could probably turn it into, Michael, if they just type this, it'll, it'll automatically do this. Cool, uh, I'm not that advanced yet, but it's a way to do it. Same time, and this is actually the method I like, I have them print it out. So I've sized it so it fits on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. And you create your own key, whether you're just going to you know, uh, diagram something in and draw arrows, or you're going to shade it, or you're going to color it, whatever else, and you carry that with you. And I found that that actually works the best. You, just, you carry it with you. It's a good reminder, a good token. You stay aware of your time. Now, one thing I want to talk about here, too, is y- you're going to want to do this completely and you're going to want to do it consistently. And that's why I like doing it manually, but you got options here. You're going to want to include your mornings. You want to include the nights. You want to include the weekends. One of the things you learn early on with this is uh, if you're not careful, suddenly everybody's worked exactly eight hours every day mm-hmm. for two weeks. And you're like, wait, that's not – no, no, no. Th- this is the thing. This is why I said this is not time tracking. This is not time tracking. This is not gotcha. This is not – see, I told you you weren't working hard enough. This has really got to be a – Track your time for two to three weeks, and then we're going to aggregate that data. And sometimes that's actually the role I'll play, Paul. People just send it to me, and I'll aggregate it so that you can still get your individual benefit, right? You filled out the form, but then I've aggregated the details at the team and at the, at the group at the overall level. You can't single out any individual. It's, it's, it's much simpler that way because then it's, it's not a game of gotcha. So that's, that's the basics of it. This is how over a two-week period – you track that time. And then at the end, I give people a summary sheet and we actually put in time. I have them put in time by day, by category. Uh, sometimes that gives us a pretty good histogram of where time is going by days and we can pick a pattern out of it. And then fundamentally, we add up. So how many hours were worked out of the expected hours? That gives us an idea of margin. How many hours were allocated against each of these different categories? And then we can break it down in a number of ways from that. So it's it's just it's the simplest way I've figured out in the last couple of years to get this data fast without causing a lot of pain and without needing to change anything. Cool. All right, here's the value. Uh, and when we talk about value, and, and you know what, we'll have to do a segment on this at some point too. But but I've come down to uh, Elf, uh, uh, emotion, logic, and finance. There are other stuff. In fact, this is one of the things I've learned working with teams in the last uh, year or so. I used to have a more complicated way to do value. Now, to be fair. There's not a lot of stuff out there to actually help people calculate value. So I was really proud of myself for having something that was complicated. And I had a team say, you know, um, we took the first part that you did and just threw it away. And we just used the motion logic and, and financial stuff. And wow, that made a total difference for us. Lesson learned. I've inverted the pyramid. Let's do that. So let's talk about the emotional value of this. What's the emotional value of just knowing where your time is going? And, and think about it this way, Paul. Imagine if you've been telling people for a while, guys, we are, we are running on thin ice. We are on the margins here, and we are getting blown out by unplanned work. People go, right, yes, unplanned work. When you can come back and actually say, well, we've measured it for two weeks, and this is exactly how much unplanned work we have, and this is the chaos that's causing us, and it's causing people to work nights and weekends, and my team is burning out. Now you have evidence. Now you have data. Now you've got something to show people. By the way, logically, then, you can also show them the data, show them the patterns. You can even potentially show them who's making the requests or why this isn't efficient. And then from a financial perspective, and this one takes a little bit more time, 
But we've talked before about time value of money. We've talked about how to calculate the value. And if you've done that even ballpark for your team, then you get this chance to look at that and come back and you can start adding up how much time and money it's costing you. Now, I find there's really good personal benefit. And I'll be fair. The first couple of days you do this, you're hyper aware. And so you make really good decisions with your time. That's why we do this for at least two weeks because you kind of get back into a normal pattern and that's good because that's what you want to see. You want to see that it really, what's really going on. And that's the beauty of this. You get that benefit immediately. Sure. At the end of the two weeks, I can aggregate it all up and we can talk about it and what it means and present it. But if you're doing this and you're taking a look at your time, just that level of awareness, huge lift immediately. Now there's a risk with that too, that sometimes we get so spun up, we try to make all these changes really fast. All I try to do is just say, look, don't worry about that too much. Get a sense of it. Let's have some stuff to talk about. You then can almost immediately figure out your unplanned impacts and as well as the capacity of your team, which now means you can answer those questions. If you can answer those questions, now we can start moving forward with stuff. So that, that's where I get excited about it. it it's got to inform action, right? So if we talk about value prop and we say, what's the problem? Right? What's your solution? How do you do it? What's the value of that solution? What's the impact? That's where we've got to go get this stuff figured out because we need to understand how much we're being impacted, which is preventing us from positively impacting other people. A little circular at this point, but that's one of these, these data collection things. Here's what I tend to see when a team works through this typically. The unplanned time is, is absolutely crushing teams. And it's, it's the, if you think about the way most of us have come up in security, it's always been reactionary. It's always been response driven and it's, it's therefore tough to break out of that. And, and it's, so what most teams is they're just getting so crushed by it. They don't even know how much is happening. All we do know is it's absolutely preventing us from doing the stuff that we wanted to do. And that's, that's soul sucking like that absolutely sucks. We do find too, a lot of people are working nights and weekends when people know that there's some level of anonymity to it and they can actually tell us what's up. I think that's important. If we start looking at teams and team health and team dynamics and whether we're a team versus a collection of individuals, the teams that are working around the clock nonstop burn out the fastest and, and they, they just, it's not a sustainable pace. Knowing that now means we can make some better choices and or put some stuff in place that gives people some of their time back. So what I love about this is almost out of the jump, if you're struggling to justify headcount or to narrow down projects or to figure out how to rescope something, you have a bunch of data at your disposal to start doing that. Yeah, but, and no one works <clears throat> super efficiently when you're just going from like one fire to the next, like one piece of unplanned work to the next, right? You think about the Brent character yep. in the Phoenix Project. You know, certainly that I've been there, 2003, working for a university when there's worms running around the network and we were just completely unprepared for that situation. Like basically you're in firefighting mode for sometimes a year before you can kind of start to get ahead of things. But during that year, you're just not working efficiently, right? You don't have time to do other things other than just address the unplanned work. And that just has a spiraling effect. Yeah, there's a book uh, by Cal Newport called Deep Work. It's on my list of things to review to determine if it makes it into our book list or at least when it fits in. It's, it's, but everything I've read about the work and everything I've learned on it is exactly what you just said. It's that there's a penalty for task switching. And it's a, it's a high penalty, far more, even though we will pretend, right? And somebody right now say, no, no, I, I multitask very well. Or if we're a little more astute, I multi-thread very well. Ha ha, funny. Yeah, no, actually you don't. We just, it's not something that we're good at. Now, there's ways you can get better at it based on routines and habits and structures and all this stuff. But fundamentally, if you're doing unplanned work that then gets hijacked by unplanned work that then gets hijacked by other unplanned work, you're, the attention residue and the buildup of that is devastating. I don't know about you guys, but I've seen this myself. There's, it's that night, right? Oh, I'm going to push through. I'm going to do it. And you, you chug your five-hour energy or your Red Bull, hopefully no vodka in it, whatever you got to do. And, and then you're sitting there and you're looking at the same page over and over and over. And you start drifting. And you're like, why am I doing this? Wait, what's going on? Yeah, guys, that's horrible time. Like we, we are simply not productive. And again, my own self, because I do not yet have sleep and diet figured out to the way that I want it to, let alone uh, running a household with six people in it. But we, we are trying collectively. And every little gain we make, it's compounded the benefit for us. So I, I'm a firm believer in this stuff all the way through. Now, I want to go back to the other point you said. And, and on the same thing, this becomes a really cool baseline for us to start to understand stuff. But then it lets us start asking those next level questions. So this is what I call the second and third progressions. You, you start, just, just show me what it is, right? Get me a picture. But at that next step, 
fact, let me do this in conjunction uh, with some setting some context. Ideally, what, what you get out of this is something that you can do. Now, I, I want to warn you off of, well, we've got to do something, so let's do this. No, well, please don't. When you sit and work with these teams and you ask them if they're willing to do this, they'll always tell you yes. But if you get them privately, they'll say, yeah, but is anything going to change? Is it really going to make a difference? Or is this just going to prove I'm overworked and no one does anything? So our instinct of I got to do something sometimes gets in the way of I should probably do the right thing. And what that means is entirely context dependent. But it, 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 if you're not alleviating whatever the top challenge is, right, that if you're not elevating that constraint, as we would say in the Phoenix Project, you're going to run into more problems. And, and the people that you're supporting, that you're supposed to elevate, they're waiting on you to get that done the right way. What I've done when I talk with people is say, hey, if we were making progress in 30 days, even if it might take us, Paul, to your point, a year to really get to a different place, would you be okay? And universally, people say, yeah, that'd be great. So what I then said to them is, you know, 30 days from now then, if we've made enough material changes you guys feel good with it, would you be willing to do this again? But now it's what we call uh, assessing intention. So now you start your day focusing more on planned or anticipated work, and you've set an intention. And at the end of the day, you're not only calibrating how you did, but you're assessing, did we hit the intention, yes or no? Then the third step, when we, when we really start rolling these changes and we want to keep the momentum going, but also check that it's working, is what I call the effectiveness or the value of it, which is then to say, how did I do with intention? Yep, hit it, nope, got derailed. And how effective was that? Because sometimes you can get derailed and it was really valuable, it was really good. Sometimes you get derailed and it was horrible. Sometimes you do exactly what you plan to do and you get to the end of the day and say, that was totally not what I should have done, right? But that's higher level stuff. And that's where like, we talk about that Phoenix Project. So it's not just, hey, I'm dealing with unplanned work. It's I'm dealing with unplanned work and I need to minimize it. Oh, and we see it's in these categories. Oh, and we can parcel this up and hand it off to somebody else, which then means we can work on this anticipated work. That's taking too much time. What can we, right? It's how we start finding those patterns and breaking that down. And that's adding in intention and then, of course, some reflection on, on both the intention and then the effectiveness of it. But we don't start there. And please don't start there. I was just pointing out that as, as we were kind of going with it, this is the starting point. Five minutes a day, two, three weeks tops, gather your data, aggregate it, take a look at it. But you could use the same concept and add one or two pieces on it. Still not extending much more than five to 10 minutes a day, but seeing if your changes are actually working. And, and you know, mostly what this comes down to is somebody's got to make some hard choices. It's really tough. All the plates we think we've got spinning, all the plates we're trying to put up, all the stuff we don't want to stop, and we think that it's impossible, right? It's, we got so good at saying no that we're now terrified of saying no. And this is a good way to at least figure out what you're capable of doing or how it works. No, <clears throat> I like it. And it definitely borrows, you know, from a lot of concepts that, it, you know, I learned that's from exactly the Phoenix right. Project. Yep. So, um, and, and that's totally in line, but it's also how to execute some of those things. Uh, so I like your, uh, you know, what the book doesn't go through the Phoenix Project or even beyond the Phoenix Project is like how to, how to measure that and categorize the work. Yep. You know, certainly they build the whole Kanban board and all that stuff, but that's not really how to categorize work, Michael. And I think you've done a really nice job of outlining how you can categorize that work. So then maybe you know which Kanban boards to build and things like that. So I think no, it's that's great. exactly right. That's exactly right. And what's great about this is when you work with like, uh, so typically when I'm working with somebody in this range, they might have like three to four, maybe as many as five sub teams. And each one wants to do it a slightly different way. That's awesome. I, this does now come up a lot. People say, oh, this is like DevOps or Sec DevOps or whatever. You know, this is some sort of agile thing. Yeah, kind of. Really, all it is is it's using a lot of those same concepts or at least it fits the in, into them really well. But as you point, this is all about execution. So what I've looked at is over years of trying this out, what got in the way of execution? What overcomplicated it? And it really came down to figuring out 30-minute blocks, categories, tracking it all, aggregating it, and then analyzing it. So I wanted to share that with our, with our audience uh, because this has been a question. It's stuff that people are looking at. And it's also something that I've found that pretty much every team I work with now, we've been doing this, and it's been remarkable what we learn and, and what we're then able to build on that. And I wanted people to have that, which is a good time for us to take a quick break. And when we come back... We're going to talk about the exits, the rounds, all the trends and innovation. In the meantime, go to securityweekly.com, sample our shows, check out the on-demand content, look at all the other ways we're making sure you're ahead of the curve, and then we'll come back and talk innovation. <laughs> 